presenter, our end note, now that we're back on time, miraculously, is a gentleman by the name of Bo Wall. He is the president of D-Wave Technologies Systems. D-Wave Systems. <laughs> Not bring it well. It uh, really should be D Wave Research, but we call it D Wave Systems. So. He's going to be talking about a very controversial subject quantum computing. And he also happens to be, go by another name, which is the grandfather of my children. <laughs> very pleased to have my father presenting today. So, my real name's Robert Ewald, and I've seen and known some of you in your places for a long, long time. I kind of grew up in high performance computing and used to run computing at Los Alamos a thousand years ago, and then was at Cray Research for about a hundred years, and then and was the president of Cray Research and some other things, and then was the CEO at Silicon Graphics, and I've done a variety of startups, and I've been helping. Uh, D-Wave. Along those those times, I've had a, you know how Americans are with nicknames. So my given name is Robert, and then as a young American boy, you're called Bobby. Robert has six letters, Bobby has five. In uh, about the time I was in our high school, my friends called me Big E, which had four letters. And then you become Bob, which has three letters. And then when I was at Los Alamos, they took another letter off, and I was just left with two letters, a B and an O. So wherever I met you along those lines, please call me whatever you would like. And, and, but only one of you can call me dad here. So, so, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I, uh, so thanks so much for the invitation to speak. Uh, we're going to just give uh, sort of a quick little introduction to uh, quantum computing and then a little bit about the D-Wave machine itself. We're planning to be at ISC again this year. In fact, we're talking about having a seminar of some kind which in which we would spend a few hours talking a little more detail about this. So uh, if you happen to be there, we'd love to see you uh, there again. We have a booth and all of that sort of thing. But thanks so much for the invitation to be here and to speak. And we'll just go quickly, and this is uh, the, the talk I'm sure you've all been looking forward to today because it is the last talk. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we'll talk you know, just a little bit of background. We've heard about the coming end of Moore's Law. Uh, this was the original electronics magazine that what became later known as Moore's Law was published in. Um, magazines were things that were printed on paper. They came out about once a week or once a month. Some of you probably don't remember those, but that's what they were, and this was the source of the original Moore's Law, and that was the actual paper uh, in that version of electronics magazine. Interestingly enough, this is from The Economist. This just came out about 10 days ago. The Economist, every quarter, The Economist started off as a magazine. Now it's probably a web property and all kinds of things like that. But uh, each quarter they put out a thing called the Technology Quarter. And about 10 days ago, this one came out, and it's surprisingly after Moore's Law. And interestingly, over the last six months, I've uh, been invited to give talks at um, four different conferences about post Moore's Law, Moore's Law 2.0, or all of those sorts of things. I, I personally believe, after having been in this business for you know 2,000 years or something, that uh, our friends at Intel and IBM and Nvidia and uh, Mellanox and elsewhere are going to continue to push the state of the art uh, using the current technology, but it's going to get more complicated to use, continue to get more complicated to use, and, and clearly things are changing. So what we have done at D-Wave is figured out a way to try to get on a different computing paradigm, and it's quite different. It's quite different. So we'll show you what that looks like. And I put the, uh, uh, the reference to this article from The Economist up at the top. And this came from the, uh, the Economist article itself, and these were predictions. Now, not just Moore's Law, these are predictions for the end of Moore's Law. And there's also, be, so you can see Moore's Law, the, the year at which it's supposed to end is sort of sliding along, and uh, Gordon Moore himself has predicted several times <laughs> both that it would be extended and when the end of it would come. And then there's now a law about Moore's Law, and... Uh, this was Peter Lee, a fellow at Microsoft Research, who said the number of people predicting the death of Moore's Law doubles every two years. I think it's faster than that, actually, based on the conferences I've been invited to, but it's something like that. What we're doing is on a different law, and I don't know if it's Feynman's Law or Nature's Law or 
whose law exactly, but Richard Feynman was the one who, over a period of 20-ish years or so, started thinking and talking about the potential, a physicist, but famous physicist, uh, started talking about the potential to be able to build a different type of computer, to harness quantum effects to actually do something useful, uh, as opposed to fighting it, which is in reality what we do with most, uh, in most computer companies today, or most uh, semiconductors today. So it was started with Feynman. The idea behind it is that rather than fighting against quantum effects, quantum effects in a traditional computer can cause bit flips, leakage currents, a whole variety of things that are bad. Um, so you fight against those. In this case, the idea is can you use quantum effects to help do some computing? And there are three major quantum effects that one would use. And in traditional computing, we're used to a world in which... Um, things are binary. There is zero or a one, period. That's it. We're used to things that are separable. So if we have two bits or two words, they're unique and we have to treat them uniquely. And when we run into a barrier, whether it be a, a barrier on uh, an, uh, a barrier on a device, or whether it be we're doing a search, we run into that barrier, we somehow have to get over the barrier. We have to climb it. We have to go to a higher energy, if you will, to be able to get over the barrier. We'll contrast that with the way to apply uh, quantum effects in a quantum computer. And the first one that you usually hear the most about is superposition. In fact, we even have a t-shirt featuring superposition that we've given away at some of the conferences. Um, but superpos with superposition, and it's an inherent fact of nature, it's a little hard to fathom, but quantum, uh, quanta quantized things can be a zero or a one or both simultaneously. And so you can use that to, to an advantage in computing. And you can also probably carry some information in, the, in some additional information in the combination of those states. And entanglement, which is a little hard to get from this picture over here on the right side, but it's the idea that when things, when quantum things become entangled, they, you can no longer treat them as separate or independent or individual items. Instead of having like 10 separable fingers, if they become entangled, I no longer, they no longer operate independently. So they become entangled, and then you have to treat the ten fingers as one unit, if you will. And then the last uh, effect, and the one that's probably easiest to see, is quantum tunneling. And that's related to the barrier thing that we talked about. In traditional computing, you hit a barrier, and you have to put more energy in somehow to get over the barrier. And in, with a quantum effect, you can actually tunnel through the barrier to get to a lower, lower energy state. And, um, and so you fight most of those things in traditional computers. We're harnessing those things. And there's a very nice little animation there. Look at that. And I don't know what it's doing now. But um, so with the original ideas of Feynman, uh, there was in, uh, uh, as shown in this paper from a, the mid 80s, uh, David Deutsch wrote a paper and said, you know, we could take some of those ideas and build a computer. A, we could build a quantum computer. So that was sort of the first theoretical work that said, or abstract work that said, in fact, you could take some of these principles that Feynman and others had been espousing and build a computer. And that then led over the next 20 years or so to people working on theoretical algorithms. Some of the more famous ones are shown here. And I say theoretical because there aren't any quantum computers to run them on yet today that are of the type that Deutsch and other, others espoused. The most famous one that you hear about is Shor's algorithm. Um, and it is... Uh, shown that theoretically, if, you, if there were a quantum computer that you could run Shor's algorithm on, you would be able to break uh, codes. You'd be able to factor numbers quickly and effectively. And so the concern is that you'd be able to 
um, uh, decrypt things which had been encrypted using today's fact uh, today's uh, encryption techniques, uh, you could sort of retroactively decrypt things. So that's a concern that, that both people have, I know um, governments have, and businesses have. That's the most famous one and the one you read about. And to my knowledge, there is no computer out there today that can run Shor's algorithm. There are a couple of examples of factoring numbers, and I'll talk about those in a second. But sort of the state of the art here in factoring numbers is very, very small compared to what you can do on a traditional computer. So with, with that as background then, there's been research going on on how to build a quantum computer, how to build quantum devices, sensors, quantum communication, quantum key distribution for 30 years. And it's estimated that there are some several billions of dollars going into quantum research of one kind or another. The part we're going to focus on a little bit is on the right side here, and there are several different theoretical ways to be able to build a quantum computer. There's work going on at Delft here in Europe. There's uh, been work at uh, a lot of interest at ETH, uh, all, all over the continent, uh, Japan, uh, and a, a lot in the U.S., so different ways of building a quantum computer. We won't go into any of these, but I'm going to jump a little deeper into the one that turned out to be the most easy, easily implemented. And so there's one really based on photonics, and I won't read all this stuff. We'll make all of these things available for you if you would like, but that's one approach. It's going to take probably quite a while to be able to do that. Another approach called a, a measurement-based or uh, another way of calling it, I think, is a one-way quantum computer. You can read what that's like, but lots and lots of work left to do on those. These are probably 10 to 20 years away to be able to actually instantiate these machines. This is one that Microsoft is working on or an idea that Microsoft is working on called a topological quantum computer. And... It is a great theory. It's awaiting the discovery of the non-abelian quasi-particle pair that's shown at the bottom here, which has been, you know, maybe observed in a couple of laboratories. So long way of saying that very interesting research work may pan out at some point, but um, awaiting discovery of a particle probably means that it's a ways away. So the one that does seem to uh, work, and we can demonstrate that it does, was uh, the idea behind it started with a fellow named Nick Metropolis at Los Alamos and a couple of others, and they published a paper in 1953 called Simulated Annealing. And the idea was to be able to use a traditional computer to simulate a, an, an annealing or sort of what we today, for this machine, call an adiabatic process. So it started then, it got some traction, the idea did, running on standard computers, simulating annealing, um, and, the, and it was uh, oriented around some Monte Carlo calculations and extending those sorts of things. And then uh, in about 2000, some folks uh, led by Eddie Farhi at MIT, another group in Japan, and some people here in Europe said, you know, you could maybe build you, someone, could maybe take that idea and build a quantum annealing computer or an adiabatic quantum computer. So this was sort of the research work. And there were a couple of fellows who were then PhD graduate students at the University of British Columbia in Canada, and they had just taken a course in entrepreneurship. And they said, in 1999, Let's start a company. What do we know about? What can we build a company around? And they said, quantum stuff. So they started actually by aggregating patents around things quantum, believing that those might be useful at some point. And those of us who've been in the business for a long time of creating and, and uh, uh, collecting patents know that that's always a good idea, but it's always uh, less valuable, I shouldn't say always, but <laughs> most of the time less valuable than you think. So after a, a few years, they said, you know, maybe we should pick up this idea and see if we could build a quantum computer. And so they set about doing that about, uh, gee, 12 years ago now or so and started hiring some engineers, some more device physicists, and uh, put together the company that's today known as D-Wave. 
And basically what, what this machine does, and we'll show you sort of how to think about it, at least conceptually, is that if you jump to the bottom, what, it, what this machine does is it, um, it will go to a low energy state. I've kind of got these maybe in the reverse order, but it will, it will seek a low energy state, which is represented by this objective function shown at the bottom. So that is a representation of what the computer is doing, is solving that equation over qubits and over the interconnection between the qubits. And so the way to think about that is with this chart. And basically, if you can transform, if you have a problem that looks like or you can transform into a landscape, here I've shown a three-dimensional landscape like the Alps with mountains and valleys and lakes. If you can transform, if you have a problem that's transformable into something like that, then what this computer, this technique will do is that it will find the lowest valley or valleys in that energy landscape, probably. It's not guaranteed to find them, but it's probabilistic and it probably will find the lowest valley or valleys. And you'll remember with traditional computer, we talked about barriers. So if you're with a traditional computer, if you're looking for the lowest valley or valleys in this landscape and you pick some arbitrary starting point, say one of those lakes kind of there in the middle, and you want to see if there are lower valleys, the traditional computer techniques sort of start searching around in that valley and then climb one of the hills and then try to look over the hill and maybe descend the hill and say, oops, this valley's not lower, let's climb back up, should we climb back over this other range and that sort of thing. You can imagine how that works. And the idea with the quantum computer is that it's not really a three-dimensional energy landscape, but it's an n-dimensional energy landscape and it collapses to the low energy solution or a low energy solution and probably gives you the best answer. But probabilistic, so you need to run, people tend to run problems multiple times, at least on our machines. No error correction, so you run, so again, probabilistic, and so you run a problem over and over and over again. So people will run problems 10 times or 100 or 1,000 and get either a lot of the same solutions or if the landscape is flat, you know. Um, so, so this machine, I'll show you an example in a second that Google just published in December of a landscape in which the mountain ranges are very steep and very narrow. The valleys are deep and then more sharp mountains, more deep valleys. If that's what the landscape is like, as opposed to uh, sandpaper, you know, the sandpaper makes sense. Uh, we use it in America to smooth wood, so a piece of paper with little pieces of sand glued onto it that you can use to smooth wood. If it's more like a piece of sandpaper, so short mountains and not much valleys and not much differentiation, it doesn't work as well there. But if the problem is deep valleys and steep mountains, it seems to be better suited to that. So that's at least conceptually a way to think about this is energy, n-dimensional really energy landscape collapsing to uh, the low energy solution or solutions. That's a little different than what we're used to. And <clears throat> this is how we build the machines and then I'll contrast it to traditional computers. So again, the company has been around now about 17 years. Um, the first uh, quantum com commercial quantum computer came out four years ago from D-Wave, 128 qubits, and it was purchased by Lockheed Martin, a uh, defense company in the U.S., and they share it with the University of Southern California's Information Sciences Institute, so in the Los Angeles area. Uh, USC runs it for Lockheed. They each have about half the machine. And some of our colleagues from Europe run on it from time to time. Oops. And the second machine uh, was purchased by Google. And they have the same idea in that the Google machine is at NASA Ames in uh, Silicon Valley. 
And so NASA Ames operates the machine and they have about half of it and Google has about half of it. And the third machine was just purchased by Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, last fall. And they wanted to get started, so they started running on it in our factory. And we're just now taking it apart and shipping it to them. So about four years ago, Lockheed's machine was 128 cubits. The Google machine was the first 500 cubit machine. And then this summer, we installed a 1,000 cubit machine at, at Google NASA Ames. A uh, thousand cubit machine was just handed over last week to Lockheed Martin, and the Los Alamos machine is also a thousand cubit. So there will soon be three one thousand cubit machines in operation. And again, based on how we described the problem, what the, the the way this machine works, it's good for certain classes of optimization problems. We think. We think that based on work Google and we and others have done, it's probably good for some machine learning or deep learning applications. And then probably also because of the way it works for some Monte Carlo or sampling sorts of applications where you're looking for a collection of possible answers. But it's mostly unproven. It's still a research and experimental machine today, really. Um, the world that we uh, know is in the middle column here, and I went through uh, uh, some Intel manuals, this was a year and a half ago or so, just to sort of be able to write down uh, the world that we live in today, typically in a, an Intel 64-bit architecture, and then contrast that with the D-Wave system. So performance in gigaflops is bazillions of flops these days, floating point operations. The D-Wave machine does zero flops, no floating point calculations at all. It, you can make it add a number if you simulate gates and all this stuff, but it's really not very good at it. And uh, so it doesn't do any floating point operations natively, which is a pretty big difference. Um, instead of 64 bits of precision, we have as standard precision. With the D-Wave machine, when you're specifying this model, you only today have four or five bits of precision. So you don't have a lot of uh, dimensionality in creating the model, which is a limiting factor today. We'll improve that as we go along. And instead of doing millions and billions of operations per second, the D-Wave machine does 10,000 operations per second, period. 10,000, no matter the size of the problem, it does 10,000 operations per second, which sounds pretty minuscule. But in a second, I'll show you that each of those uh, operations, in fact, incorporates or encapsulates a lot of, um, a lot of calculations that you, you would have to do if you were doing a search and trying to climb out of a low valley. Instead of having roughly 500 instructions, this machine is the original, really, really, really reduced instruction set computer. It has one instruction. Very long instruction word. In that one instruction word, you basically package the problem that you're creating. So one instruction. You specify the qubit weights, the strengths of interactions between the qubits to create this landscape. And then you tell it how many solutions you want. 10 or 100 or 1,000 or something like that. So one instruction, so conceptually that's quite simple. The little challenge is though going from a real problem into that instruction. Um, we operate a little cooler than most computers do. It's near absolute zero. In fact, the thousand qubit machines are operating at about 15 millikelvin, which is colder than interstellar space by quite a bit. And it's probably, it's certainly the harshest place on this planet, may be the harshest place in the universe in terms of temperature, vacuum, uh, and uh, free freedom from uh, other interference. It uses, it's superconducting, uses no power to run the, the chip, and as opposed to, you know, 100 watts or so. And we're up to about 1,000 qubits today. And this is the really important one, I think, as we think about how do you program it. Uh, in maturity, as opposed to having been under development by lots of smart people since 1945 or so, this really has been being used by a, lot of, by a handful of smart people for four years. And uh, it's more like it must have been in 1955 or something like that at IBM. 
1955, IBM had a, you know, they had a few customers, and they were transitioning away from these tried and true vacuum tubes to this new thing called a transistor. And they were moving from storage tube memories to this new core memory, and how was that all going to work? And in the back room, there were some folks working on a thing called the formula translation system. But at that point, if you were doing scientific calculations, you did them in uh, assembly language and you debugged it in machine language. And so our equivalent of a Fortran compiler or a higher level language hasn't been invented yet. So it must be something like that. Having said that, it won't take us 60 years, uh, you know, another 60 years to catch up with that level of maturity and we'll show you a little about that. But it's, my point is, it's really research and experimentation today for people who want to be pioneers and be the first ever to write quantum algorithms and do specific things. And it's a challenge to use. So this is, again, kind of what it looks like. It comes in a box that's about three meters by three meters by three meters high. And it's perform at 1,000 qubits today. And we've talked about, and we'll come back and talk about the performance and stuff. The system in total uses a little bit less than 25 kilowatts. The chip itself uh, is, uh, you know, essentially zero. And this is three of them in the uh, factory that we have. And again, they come in this big box. And the box, the, the computer itself, if, if you even should call it a computer, the computer itself is about the size of your thumbnail. And we'll, we'll jump in this box and take a look at what it looks like. But that's really what it is. And for it to operate in a quantum manner, we have to make sure that there's no radio frequency interference, no magnetic interference, no vibration. And so this big box is mostly air, but it's like a skiff, um, a Faraday cage. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with how they do things in the classified world. So it comes with its own Faraday cage that goes around it to uh, keep the interference to a minimum. It has its own uh, two-stage refrigeration system, part liquid nitrogen and part liquid he a particular type of liquid helium. And there are three racks in the front of it. The one where the fellow is standing here is uh, one that provides a host computer out to the network that you're operating on and some control uh, systems. Refrigeration is in the middle and then some more monitoring equipment in the third rack. So if we stepped inside that big box, you would find that it's plenty big, and we made it big enough so as we build these, you can have, and we're cycling on them, you can have actually three people in there working on it at, at once. So that's what determined the size of the box, was so we could have two or three people in there working simultaneously. And it doesn't look like much. It looks like a you know, a garbage can or something. But that garbage can is actually a container or a shield. And as those, the Russian dolls stack together, it's the same idea here that inside that big container, there is another container and another and another and another. And at each level inside, those containers attach to these gold disks that you see here. And the gold disks are um, about, you know, that wide and then they get wider as you go up and you can see how the temperature goes down from liquid nitrogen temperature at the top all the way down to this 15 millikelvin at the bottom where the actual uh, quantum chip is operating and that's what it looks like it's just it would look to you just like a standard chip uh, standard IC and again about the size of your fingernail. And this one had this is a thousand qubit version. Uh, you can see perhaps that there are little square boxes on that. Those those are we do it we fab it just like you do other semiconductors and that we have a standard cell that we replicate. Each of those cells has. Um, uh, has an array, so this is one of those unit cells, has an array of four qubits by four qubits, where a qubit is one of these quantum bits that we talked about earlier. We run them on a standard CMOS semiconductor line. There are a few little tricks in doing that, but uh, there's a company called Cypress Semiconductor uh, in the U.S., and we run this uh, in their Minneapolis uh, fab, and we do a little part of the process. 
We use niobium to basically create a Josephson Junction device. And so that's sort of the only specialty here, and, or the only particular uh, trick here. And again, those qubits overlap so that uh, uh, the, red, the red line is drawn on, the red lines are drawn on the top, but so that that horizontal qubit at the top actually overlaps four vertical qubits and so that horizontal qubit can have an influence on those vertical qubits. And then we have some other connectors so that qubits can have an influence off. So it's sort of like early days of MPP when a processor could communicate to its nearest neighbors. That's sort of the idea here. And one of the limiting factors, frankly, is that qubits, it would be great if qubits could influence a broader set of qubits, but today they can't. So we've created a logical way to do that that old vector people will laugh at the terminology, but it's called chaining, where we chain a number of these qubits together so that one qubit can in fact influence others, but we sort of make them communication qubits rather than, um, rather than functional qubits. And again, to program it, this is the uh, equation, the objective function at the bottom that we're trying to minimize, that the machine is going to minimize. The machine is going to go to a low energy, and this equation represents that. And so to program it, you give it really two things, and those are, as shown in the middle, the weights of the qubits, whether this, in your model, this qubit should be tending more toward a zero or a one or somewhere in between. And you also then give it the strengths of the interactions between qubits. How strongly does this qubit want this adjacent qubit to be the same as it is, or does it want it to be opposite, or it doesn't care too much. And so in doing that, you, you create this energy landscape, and then the machine, 10,000 times a second, solves whatever problem you've set up to do. And you read out the end state of those qubits, of the today the 1,000 qubits. So they're zeros and ones when you read them out. And then the machine is initialized and does it again, and again, and again. And so to... To use it, it's pretty easy. At some point, we'll have a cloud version of it when the software tools get a little better. But it, it's, it's a challenge to use today. Um, won't read you all of this stuff in the interest of time, but we've been developing sort of a, a stack of software that's overstating, I think, what we have. But the idea here is, as shown on the bottom, uh, we, a QMI is a quantum machine instruction. That's this one instruction that the machine executes. And um, at first, you had to program that really in machine language. You had to program the machine in machine language. Then we created libraries that are callable from C or C++ or MATLAB or Python. So you can create that uh, machine language instruction from a language that you're familiar with, run it, get the qubits back, evaluate the objective function, and do whatever you're going to do. And then we started creating some tools to make it, prototype tools, to make it a little easier to um, try to, so that a subject matter expert didn't have to speak in the language of the quantum machine. Um, so we have a tool called con a constraint satisfaction tool. We have a general optimization tool. And we're doing some work on satisfiability and, and machine learning prototype tools. And I won't, again, belabor this, but we've come up with the idea, as we did in traditional computing, uh, I don't know, 500 years ago or something, of virtual, virtual, virtual memory. And so we now can create a virtual representation of your problem, which is a lot larger than the problem. And we've only been able to do that about a year. And then we partition it and chunk it, put it on the machine, and actually then run it that way. So you'll see lots of other techniques uh, that, that would come from traditional computing being able to be applied here. So that's sort of what the evolving software environment looks like. Most of it's prototype. Um, and, uh, but the number one thing we have to do, I think, the number one and two things are get more smart people using the machine. And secondly, to do that, we need a better set of software tools to be able to make it easier to use. And then those things will feed on, on themselves as it did with vector computing, parallel computing, and all the rest. Um, I'm going to show you three charts and then we'll wrap it up. These are all from Google. And so this first chart was now about two and a half or three, a little less than three years ago. And what Google said was that we have created a little suite of benchmarks. 
and they should be pretty well suited to the D-Wave machine. They're optimization benchmarks, and they range from very small problems to large problems, large in D-Wave sense, not in the real world. And we would like you, D-Wave, to run them, and then we're going to run them on IBM's optimization software called CPLEX, which is the light color blue. We're going to run them on another optimization package called Taboo, and there was yet a third that they wanted to run them on. So these are the results. So this is two and a half years old, and it took us quite a while to be able to do this. But a couple of things to note. First, the red line is the, this is a timing chart. So uh, lower down the chart is better. The red line, which is the D-Wave results, are flat. No matter the problem size, we do about 10,000 of these really different instructions every second. That's what it does. So it's, it's flat. It doesn't care much, as you can see, about the size of the problem. But more like we're used to, you would see with CPLEX and Taboo, that as the problem got larger, in fact, it took longer and longer and longer, as you can imagine with this idea of climbing up out of these valleys, looking over the mountain range, should I go down? Uh, takes uh, For more complex problems, takes more and more time. And so out at, at the time, up to 500 qubits, the D-Wave machine turned out to be about 10,000 times faster. So they said, wow, that's an amazing result. If we can map a problem onto it that's important, maybe we can get good performance. This is sort of like the earliest days of even before LINPAC. This is more hardware performance uh, characterization that you might do within a hardware group at a system company. So not a real benchmark, but really just more performance characterization. So then they set about uh, working with D-Wave on another six-month project, which was to see if you could actually get it to do a machine learning problem. Not a, not a big one, but see if you could use it to, to recognize a car out of a set of four or 500 training images. So they gave us this standard set of, as they call them, training images. And it took, again, six months and some smart people from Google and some smart people from D-Wave, and they figured out how to turn this sort of core optimization machine uh, to be able to get it to recognize cars in this set of training images. And what they were able to do was that at the time, using this, and this wasn't their state-of-the-art algorithm, but at the time, uh, the algorithm that they gave us to compare against was about 84% effective at recognizing a car in this set of training images. And after six months and a lot of work, the D-Wave machine was about 94% effective at recognizing cars in the same images. So it was about 10 points more effective, which is a, a big improvement. But more importantly than that for Google was when they took the set of classifiers that had been developed with a D-Wave machine and put them back on the traditional computers in the Googleplex, that in fact they used only about one-third of the CPU cycles to get a better result than they had traditionally. And that was a big breakthrough. So yes, it was better at recognizing, but over time their traditional algorithm would have been able to do that or gotten better. But the classifiers from the D-Wave machine, in fact, were much more efficient when ported back. So they actually used the D-Wave machine to train the traditional computer. And the project at the time that was driving this within Google was Google Glass. Battery-operated computer. If you can save about two-thirds or conceptually save about two-thirds of the CPU cycles, you've also saved about two-thirds of the battery life, and that's a big thing. And the first and only real application of quantum, this quantum computing technique that I know of was on Google Glass because the next thing they did was say, let's just try. We're having a hard time getting Google Glass to recognize that if I'm wearing my Google Glass and I want to take a picture of something, one of the ways that we want to be able to do that is to have the user wink. And they were having a hard time recognizing the difference between a wink and no, Rich, I'm not flirting with you. I'm just winking here. Um, recognize the difference between a wink and a blink or I've got something in my eye or anything like that. And using these techniques and, again, some months of work, the wink detector that 
was running on Google Glass, in fact, came from these same techniques. So that was, that was A and the only uh, uh, sort of real world thing that we've seen from it so far. But so that was, that was two and a half years ago. Now fast forward or slow forward to last uh, December. So Google uh, got their 1,000 qubit machine in June and started running on it and created now, instead of 500 qubits, 1,000 qubits, much more complicated problems. And they had, based on a couple of years, they had some more learnings of what this machine might be even better at, what kind of problems it might be even better at. So they created, this time, benchmarks which had higher, more narrow mountains, deeper, slender valleys, and lots of those, up to the 1,000 qubit level, instead of random sort of sandpaper uh, benchmarks and said, let's run this, and again, increasing problem size. And this was the D-Wave machine, and then these were the other machines. And lo and behold, and this is from the Google blog, and you can go look it up, and there have been numerous articles written. The D-Wave machine was 100 million times faster than on a traditional machine using one core. And they did that just for purposes of scaling and how can you better things. That's a big number. And again, synthetic benchmark should run well on this machine and, and it did. So again, that I think um, indicates to Google that uh, there probably is a lot of room here in the future, something going to be important to them in the future. And Google signed a seven-year contract to be able to get D-Wave machine, every new D-Wave machine that comes along for the next seven years. And we'll see what happens after that. So, uh, so progress, and uh, we continue to work toward that in rough numbers. About every 18 months or so, the company's been able to double the number of qubits. At the same time, we're working hard to improve the connectivity. and. Over the next 10 years, this machine will also, this class of machines will also certainly become much more general purpose uh, to be able to, uh, they probably won't be exactly gate model computers. Those are still quite theoretical, but would, uh, I think, be able to solve a more general class of problems. So with that, it's really interesting stuff. You know, I had the great good fortune to be able to work at Los Alamos and Cray and SGI and some other startups where we did lots of things that had never been done before and we had a great impact on the world that we know. I honestly think that, and part of the reason why I'm helping and excited about it, is that with D-Wave and quantum computing in general, but D-Wave in particular, we have the opportunity to change the face of computing more than we did with any of those great companies. And it's really exciting. It's early days, and we need a few more smart people who have problems that they want to try and kind of be there at the, at the leading edge of this. With that, would, uh, I'm sure we're at the end of time, but we'd be glad to try to answer a couple of questions, and I'll certainly stick around and be glad to chat. Well, you did mention that the problem size, we get, we get pretty consistent time. Now the Google is stretching more, so the time increased slightly bit. But does this mean that error will... We've, uh, with, that's a great question. So will the error, Margin. marginal error increase with each new machine? And it would, except with each new generation of the machine, we try to do three things simultaneously. And one is absolutely reduce the error. We have a, a measure that we call the intrinsic control error. And so we have to believe that we have to reduce that with each generation. We also want to improve the resolution of the models, the, the number of bits that we have with each model. You have to really to be able to scale it up and then improve the topology. So. For well, the machine learning example, I was wondering um, after you training this uh, car recognizer on DVU, uh, you, you, uh, you will get the results of the weights and then this classified to the traditional computers. So at the end of the calculation, the DV sealed the weights of this uh, uh, neural network? So the D-Wave, um, so this was a case of binary classification, I think, as you saw. And so the D-Wave came up with a set of, you could uh, translate the, um, the final value of the qubits back into, into, a, into sets of classifiers. 
And when they took that set of classifiers back onto the traditional machine and substitute our, our classifiers into what they had been using was when they got the better result. It was interesting, it's, and it's, it's a laborious project to be able to do that. But it wasn't 100% obvious why it was working that way. And you can imagine that historically, this algorithm that they've been using started a long time ago and, uh, you know, and evolved over time. What the D-Wave machine was able to figure out, well, I don't know if it's fair to say the machine was able to figure out, but what the, the number one classifier that made a huge difference was that when you look at that image, what is the... You know, what's kind of the biggest thing that would stick out to your eye in terms of trying to recognize if that's a car or not? If there's a big shadow under it, it's probably a car or a rhinoceros or an elephant or something like that. And so that was actually was the, I mean, it's one of those, oh, duh, of course. But interestingly enough, the previous Google results hadn't, uh, previous Google qualifiers, classifiers, Hadn't, didn't have that as the number one. So D-Wave came up with a small set of classifiers. There were like seven or eight uh, major classifiers as opposed to 25 or 100 or something like that. Rich. What limits you from doubling qubits rapidly? Is it lithography or what? Yeah, yeah, great question. What, what limits us from being able to double the number of qubits or something uh, more rapidly. A small company, 150 people today in the entire company. Um, and so there is one design team and they work on one design and get it going and get it fielded and then work on the next one. And so in rough numbers, uh, pursuing increasing the number of qubits while trying to keep the machine balanced by reducing errors, improving the resolution, and increasing the connectivity between qubits. It's, that's what it is. Where there, um, The two things that sort of mechanically you might think of as limiting this would be, okay, are we at the state of the art of lithography? No. We're way behind the state of the art. In fact, we don't want to get it too small. So we're three or four generations behind the state of the art. So long way to go on lithography. We, to, to get more connectivity between qubits, we're probably going to have to look at more three-dimensional vias or something, as, but we know how to do that from previous lives. And then um, secondly, okay, this thing needs to run at 15 millikelvin or something like that. So is the cooling uh, satisfactory to be able to run a chip even if you had to increase the chip size and it looks like our projections are that you can probably scale the current cooling to at least 10,000 ish qubits something like that yes easier Exactly. Is, is the environment available or is it proprietary? Um, I, I mean, all of the software to express the problem. What do you do? Exactly. Exactly. So uh, ev everything on this chart that's shown in dotted lines is prototype. You would see almost all of it is in dotted lines. And uh, so, we, so a couple of things. So we have a, a simulator that people can run on, on you, you can put it on your laptop, it only goes to 128 qubits. So we can make that available to people who are interested and serious. Um, we're thinking right now as we speak about should we, we had to start someplace. So this was kind of the, the architectural chart that we can, picture that we came up with. And so we've started implementing some of these. Now we have some better ideas of what to do. And we're thinking of, um, productizing, I'm going to use that word loosely, but productizing some of this software and then probably put some of it in the open source community to try to get more work in developing the tools and using the tools and figuring out how to create even larger cubos as an internal representation and that sort of thing. I would expect that uh, over the course of the summer we'll be figuring that out. And maybe I'll take one more question, and then I'm sure we're well past the time. I should take one from this side, if there is one. Oh, no, not Addison. Yeah.
So your latter, the latter part of your statement is correct. Um, the, if you, and we can, we won't do this today, but we can create examples in which there is one very steep valley or sort of a well, if you will, and then mountains and then other valleys up here. If that's very steep, we'll probably, out of 100 times, we'll probably find that solution 92 times or something like that. And so you can be pretty well assured that that, that is the answer. And then when the, if the problems are small enough, you can take those results, put them back into that objective function we showed, and solve it on a traditional computer to deterministically to see if that is. But we're right now at 1,000 qubits, and certainly with 2,000 qubits, you're not going to be able to do that on a traditional computer. Google... This isn't for this. I probably shouldn't say that. Then I was going to say this part isn't for <laughs> for uh, publication, but um, Google spent to create the simulated annealing results on that 100 million times. They used like all the computer power of everyone in this room for a few weeks just to simulate those results. So we're sort of at the point now where you're not going to be able to do that classically. So um, deep wells um, will, uh, you'll probably get in that, get a distribution that says that that is the answer, but you can't guarantee it on this machine. If the problem looks more like this piece of sandpaper that we talked about, you'll get a sample, you'll get lots of different low energy samples because uh, if it's a piece of sandpaper which basically is flat and then has a lot of little teeny hills on it, there are a lot of low energy solutions in that and maybe, maybe just a little bit differently. different. There you'll get a, a big sampling of answers and that's interesting for some applications. But with that, would maybe I, we can talk after... So we we so that's a great question. Uh, so we do about ten thousand instructions a second, and how long does it take to switch from one to the other? Um, I don't remember the exact number, but it's fractions of uh, microseconds. Um, so we, there is a little overhead in switching from one to the other, but we're starting again using some of these old techniques of queuing up and buffering up instructions and trying to do to make sure we're doing uh, the resource scheduling on the machine in a good way. I don't remember, but it's, it's um, not huge today. Great. Well, thanks very much. Really appreciate the invitation. And uh, we'll see you around at various conferences uh, or at your own place if you would like. And really exciting stuff. Going to be part of your future at some point. And uh, so we'll, we look forward to seeing you as we go along. Thanks so much.